Hello and welcome. This video explains the concept of massive blood transfusion in obstetric patients. The video contains part one of the content. Part two is published separately. The link for the part two video is in the description box below. Remember, when a patient is hemorrhaging excessively, it is a very critical situation and consulting senior obstetricians, anesthetists and intensivists is important and necessary for all decisions. The learning objectives for this video include why do we want to learn about massive blood transfusion? What is the background for this intervention and what do we mean by it? How do we know that a patient needs massive blood transfusion? What are the critical levels at which we can identify the patient is now critical? How is this patient managed while having the blood transfusion? And what are the complications of massive blood transfusion? So, if we review the global causes of maternal death, then as recently as 2014, the World Health Organization has done a systematic analysis and shown that hemorrhage is, is responsible for 27% of all deaths in obstetrics. And out of these deaths, 6% will occur during pregnancy because of antepartum hemorrhage. 1% will occur during labor and 20% will occur during the postpartum period. So this means that as obstetricians, we will come across cases of severe hemorrhage in our professional lives and we will see these cases again and again. Due to the concerns of the World Health Organization about the large numbers of women dying due to hemorrhage, they were interested to understand the status of blood transfusion in the Eastern Mediterranean region. This includes our own country. They looked at the successes and the challenges for transfusion and they recommended that countries need to have well-coordinated national blood transfusion centers in every country, in every city, there must be organized, voluntary, non-renumerated blood donors recruited, labs which organize and which keep the blood for donation must have screening for donor samples and this screening program should be according to the World Health Organization screening program. The staff in these laboratories should be well trained to make sure that the blood is safe for transfusion. Regular audits should be done on the quality of the blood transfusion chain and there should be regional networking for collaboration to bolster the neighboring nations. So massive blood transfusion refers to the urgent transfusion which is of large volumes of blood and blood products to replace significant blood loss and maintain hemodynamic stability. The following material was reviewed for this video and the references for these are seen here. The World Health Organization published a document called The Clinical Use of Blood this was in 2002 and it is a 221 page document which contains extensive information about training as well as clinician's handbook. There's also a section on safety for blood transfusion. In addition to, that, to this, the Green Top Guidelines published their, their guidelines for blood transfusion and obstetrics and this was done in 2015.
So in addition to this, the NICE guidelines, which was published in the same year, 2015, also published a, a document called blood transfusion. The JPAC, which is the Joint United Kingdom Blood Transfusion and Tissue Transplantation Services, published a transfusion handbook on effective transfusion in obstetric practice. And this was done in 2014. The American College of Surgeons published a guideline for the management of massive blood loss in adults. In addition to these international level countrywide documents, there's also been an institutional endeavor to create their own protocols and their own guidelines for their setting. And the reference has been given for the Norfolk and Norwich University in the United Kingdom. This was published as, as recently as 2021. So any of these documents can be accessed to get more, more information about tra blood transfusions. What do we mean by massive blood loss? First, let us understand the meaning of massive blood loss. Different authors have given different definitions and they are all actually mean the same. These definitions include either there is a loss of 40% blood or, or more from the circulation. If there is loss of more than four liters in 24 hours, this means 80% of blood loss over a 24 hour period or if there is a blood loss of two liters over a three hour period or more than 150 ml per minute, according to the blood that is collected. So the first step is to recognize if a patient is having massive blood loss. If massive blood loss is taking place during an operation, then it is understandable that recognition will be early. The problem happens if the patient has post-operative blood loss, which may be concealed in the abdomen. This tends to be recognized later. Similarly, bleeding from a vaginal hematoma due to deep vaginal tears may also not be recognized early. And it may take a long time to realize. Staff in the obstetric units must always be alert to recognize active bleeding as early as possible and staff should be alerted at the first sign of bleeding before it becomes massive. The different methods for recognizing an, the need that there is blood loss and that there is a need for transfusion is clinical and monitoring of vital signs. So clinical signs include profound pallor, Severe anemia resulting from significant blood loss leading to a pale appearance of the skin and mucous membranes and altered mental status, signs of hypoperfusion to the brain such as confusion, disorientation or loss of consciousness, ongoing bleeding, active and uncontrolled bleeding with evidence of continued loss despite initial interventions. In post-operative patients, if a drain has been placed, then the drain bottle will keep filling up with blood or there may be continuous seepage into the bandages or into the dressing. And there will be hemodynamic instability. That means hypotension, patients with severe hypotension that is unresponsive to fluid resuscitation, indicating inadequate tissue perfusion and persistent tachycardia with elevated heart rate accompanied by hypotension indicating compensatory response to hypovolemia. What are the critical levels at which we can identify the patient is now critical? Some of these vital signs include a respiratory rate which is if it between 21 to 30 or a heart rate between 110 to 130 or between 40 and 50, that means 
a very uh, bradycardia oxygen percentage saturation between 85 and 89 systolic blood pressure between 71 to 80 or a compensatory hypertension of 170 to 179 temperatures between 38.6 to 39.5 when there is associated hyperthermia but usually there is hypothermia between 34 and 35 degrees a neurological state and responsiveness to pain gcs between 13 to 9 and a urine output less than 30 ml per hour these vital signs have been recognized on the basis of a study that was done and reported in the PLOS journal in 2014. Normal vital signs include respiratory rate of 14 to 16, heart rate between 60 to 100, oxygen saturation between 95 and 100, systolic blood pressure between 100 to 149, temperature between 36 to 37.5, a neurological state and responsiveness to pain, GCS between 15 and a urine output which is at least 60 ml per hour massive blood transfusion we arbitrarily mean the replacement of the patient's total blood volume by stored homologous banked blood over a 24 hour period or less this means that 10 packs of blood need to be transfused and uh, at the same time as we start the transfusion, current evidence dictates that tranexamic acid should also be given intravenously as an antifibrinolytic agent that can reduce bleeding and decrease the production of lactic acid. At the same time as the blood is being given, the patient is provided with a balanced transfusion. This means for every pack of red cells, fresh frozen plasma and platelets are also given. And the ratio is 1 is to 1 is to 1. So let's talk now about the principles of management of this critical patient. So as soon as blood, blood loss is being recognized, they, the, the person who is recognizing must immediately call all the team members, which means that all the team members who are present on the floor, either in the ward, in the labor room, in the OR, all the team members should be involved and senior staff, if they are present, should be involved. If they are not present, then they should be contacted and informed about the situation and they should be asked to give guidance on the management of this case. Immediately start resuscitation by giving high flow oxygen, place at least two intravenous lines and infuse crystalloids. At the same time, take blood samples. If the patient is losing blood very rapidly, the patient should be shifted to an area where she can be monitored and intubated. This means that the patient should be shifted to an area from where she can be shifted to the operating room or into ICU easily there should be plenty of space around the patient so people can stand around the patient and help the patient there should be monitors present in that room so that the patient can be monitored continuously to make sure that there is no further uh, deterioration and to also ensure and see if there is improvement family should also be involved and they must be informed about the situation and the patient should have a continuous monitoring. Blood samples are taken for hemoglobin, electrolytes, serum magnesium, serum calcium, prothrombin time, ABTT, fucnogen levels, and if necessary, then blood sugar levels as well. This blood should be taken for cross match and the massive transfusion protocol should be activated by calling the blood bank and calling the intensivist or the anesthetist. This can only take place in those hospitals where the blood bank is present and the blood bank has a policy for massive transfusion protocol. In those hospitals where such, uh, such uh, resources are not available, then you will have to depend upon your local resources for ensuring 
large amounts of blood are made available for the patient. At the same time, a Foley's catheter should be inserted so that urine samples are, are sent for investigation as well as the urine is continuously being monitored for the amount of urine coming out per hour. Currently, the early use of trastamine intravenously has been seen to have a very positive effect upon the hemorrhage and should be considered early in the management. It's important to understand that the hemorrhage will cause a pathophysiology, but at the same time, the blood transfusion, there will also be metabolic disturbances. And these metabolic disturbances include hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia, acid-based disturbance, hypothermia, and so it's important that as the plasma colloid osmotic pressure is maintained, at the same time, these metabolic disturbances are also collected. The other principles of management include uh, the identification of the source of bleeding and closure of this source of bleeding. For this, the patient may need to be shifted to the operating room and therefore the surgical anesthesia teams should be on standby to, to investigate and to, uh, to see where the bleeding is coming from and to, to terminate that bleeding point as soon as possible. Not only that, but at the same time, the patient has to be monitored post-operatively in a high dependency area. Now, this depends upon the hospital where you are working, whether this patient is going to be cared for in the recovery area for some time or in the intensive care, care unit or in a high dependency area. So these decisions will be made by the anesthetist and by, and by the obstetrician. But even before taking the patient to, the, to surgery, these uh, arrangements should be made because if the patient survives, then she will need all these services. Other complications of uh, hemorrhage include generalized DIC or disseminated intravascular coagulation. There may be re-bleeding from the site and complications related to hospitalization, which include deep vein thrombosis and infection. How can institutions prepare for handling massive transfusion in an obstetric emergency? So the first and the most important item on this list is to make sure that a blood bank which is able to deliver safe blood is present in a hospital and this will be availed in emergency situations. Not only that, but the operating services should be available throughout the day. This includes the, the, the place at which the operation will take place, the staff, which includes the senior anesthetists as well as technical staff. And these must be people who can take on the responsibility on a short, short term notice and who are rested and able to take on these responsibilities. The operating services should be equipped with machines, drugs, and staff to operate optimally at any time. And the OBGYN and the anesthesia departments are responsible for ensuring local protocols are in place and all the staff looking after patients in the ward are aware of what to do if an emergency occurs. All these initiatives require planning and implementation with constant monitoring and improvement of the services. So to summarize, it is important to recognize patients who are having hemorrhage. It is important to institute local resources to make sure that there is resuscitation and mobilization of other resources to help the patient. We must arrange massive blood transfusions and arrange surgical interventions and post-operative care.